I found one we hadn't used before. <laughs> Play trivia again. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone that's here. We've got some folks that couldn't be with us this morning, not feeling well, and others. And then we have Mr. Stubborn, who's joining us. <laughs> I'm just giving Mark a hard time. It's good to see you here. I know your knee's not feeling the best. God is good. For those of you that are watching online, welcome as well. Please give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know that you're there. Just say hi. Got some things going on uh, this week because, you know, it's time to ramp things back up again. We've got Bible study coming up on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And then on Saturday, it's not a movie month, so we just have one thing on Saturday, and that's our men's breakfast. Um, so come hungry, get fed, enjoy time with other guys, and uh, just fellowship and learn more about our relationship with the Lord. Then the following Saturday, I'm not sure how that happened, but we're like two weeks out now. Um, we start our 19th season of Orange Track Racing. Registration at 9.30 and racing at 10. Looking forward to uh, getting that going again this year and, and growing that ministry as well. Then in March, uh, we've got the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference. And if you didn't get a chance to sign up last week, it's back on the table back there. So get your name on there. And so we can get those tickets ordered. We look forward to having uh, the guys go with us. And iron truly sharpens iron. And we really grow out of this experience. And I've had people tell me that maybe they didn't pull too much out of the conference itself, but it was the time with the other guys that really helped bring it all together and grow. So. Um, if for no other reason, just come and hang out with us and uh, let us sharpen one another in the Lord. And then, got a, a slide for it. We don't have a date or a title, but hey, it's coming. <laughs> and so we've got the marquee up on the on the screen there, and we will be having our next movie in March at some point. And. Uh, <laughs> Got some ideas what that's going to be, but we still have to hammer out those little tiny details. That's it for the announcements. Those of you that are watching online, Diane's going to be throwing the link in there for the worship music today, so be sure to uh, listen to that after the service is ended and just worship with us with the same music that we will be singing here. It's nice today that the snow has melted some. It's a little warmer. You know, air temperature's like, what, 50 degrees warmer than what it was a couple weeks ago? So, and you know, who needs a coat? Let's get the shorts out, flip flops. And the funny thing is, is people are actually doing that. So, hey, whatever trips their trigger. Well, this morning, let's just pause for a moment and go to God in prayer. Father, we just thank you for the day that you've given. We thank you for your many blessings in our lives. And no matter what we're going through, Father, we know that you are walking alongside that path with us, Father. Sometimes we don't know how long we're going to be walking a particular path or being in a particular season. But we can have the confidence in knowing that you are there. Thank you, Lord. Be with us today as we hear your message. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 13. No verses because it's the whole chapter, and it's not a very long one. It's six verses, but it's powerful. This is David feeling forsaken by God, wrestling with thoughts of abandonment, and watch how he goes from asking God to praising God. Oh, Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle? with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day. How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O oh Lord my God, restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying, we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing I will rejoice because you have rescued me. 
I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. We've all gone through trials like this. And this could be any number of things in David's life. But he's going through trial. And when extended over a period of time, these types of circumstances, well, they can feel like we've been abandoned by God. And that's why he said, why have you abandoned me? It can feel like evil is winning. David was a powerful king and a powerful commander of the Israelite army. Even he knew that defeat was inevitable without God's intervention. We've all been riding this high of Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeye women basketball. And here, not the last game, but here not too long ago, they went up against a team and they lost. It's inevitable. We're going to have those times. But David knew that in the midst of all of it, that he had to trust God. David's confidence in the Lord and his faithful love was his commitment to God's covenant, to God's people. And regardless of the actions of David's enemy, God's enemy, David was re determined to rejoice. Likewise, we should live with expectation in the goodness of God as we wait for him to move in our own situation. So how long, Lord? We ask this question for many different reasons. Some are very trivial and pretty vain or just self-serving. Like, how long, long, Lord, until the Baskin Robbins opens up on First Avenue? When are they going to tear that building down and put it up? It's been in the play for over a year and a half. But is that really important? How long, Lord? That question was asked to me this week. In not those exact words, but in a general sense. How long do I have to wait? And then I get a text the next day. What did you do? And my answer was, I believed in a big God and agreed with you in prayer. Now, is that trial over for them? No. Is there some more to go through? Absolutely. But rejoicing in where they are at and the hope that they have at that in that moment. But really, how long do we have to struggle with disappointments? With money? Health issues? Maybe that's a, a disease that you have that you could never get rid of. Maybe it's a surgery that was just had. Just before service, I got a, a, a message on Facebook. It was a general message to a post that um, Ellen Dean's mom had put out on Facebook because she had surgery this morning at 8. And the surgery went well. And she is, on, they really truly believe at this point they're on the road to being mended. But I'm not sure how far they had to go, whether it was a toe or if they took her let one of her legs all the way up to her knee. But they had been going through this for months. How long, Lord? You may be asking, how long will these problems with my relationship last? I sat on the floor of an apartment alone asking God why. How long is this going to go on, God? How long will I feel like this? How long till this is over? You may be asking yourself, how long will I struggle with this addiction? Most of you don't know this, but at one point in time, I was a smoker. And then, and, and I quit. And I started again. And I quit. And I started again. It was a multi-year thing. And finally, God said, we're going to do something here, but you may not like it too much. I had surgery for sleep apnea. They did six operations on my face and or my mouth and my neck and 
Worst two weeks of Diane's life. But I and I couldn't wait to have one as soon as I got done with re you know getting out of that. Getting to the two weeks is like mm, no. The good Lord gave me all that to have surgery. I don't want to do that to have more surgery. That's something that I might cause. That was what got me out of that. But it was years. You may be asking, how long more do I have to deal with these temptations? How long will it take for me to get over this loss? How long, Lord? In our call to worship this morning, David cries out to God four times saying, how long? And there will be times in our lives that it does feel like God has forgotten. It can feel like he is hiding his his face where we can't sense his presence where we wrestle with our thoughts everything feels like it's a battle every single day a struggle it may not seem like it but talking to God can help put things into perspective and sometimes God places someone in your path that helps to put those things into perspective. Now, we talked a little bit about that last Sunday, and we talked about it again on Wednesday night during Bible study, how we must talk to God, but we have to listen. Another lesson we can learn from David is that when we are talking to God, we can be real. We can be raw but we have to be specific. And although this psalm is very short, it is a prayer to God that starts out in despair but ends in hope. Now both the Passion Translation and the Message put this prayer into words that sound more like what we might use. And I had them both in here as of last night, and I was like, yeah, I just need one. But then I struggled as to which one. So I ended up choosing the Passion Translation. And here is how the, it's worded here. And listen to how he, this, this way it gets raw and it gets real. I'm hurting, Lord. Will you forget me forever? How much longer, Lord? Will you look the other way when I'm in need? How much longer must I cling to this constant grief? I've endured the shaking of my soul. So how much longer will my enemy have the upper hand? Take a good look at me, Yahweh, my God, and answer me. Breathe your life into my spirit. Bring light to my eyes in this pitch black darkness, or I will sleep the sleep of death. Don't let my enemy proclaim I prevailed over him. For all my adversaries will celebrate when I fall. I've always trusted in your kindness, so answer me. I will spin in a circle of joy when your salvation lifts me up. I will sing my song of joy to you, Yahweh. For in all of this, you have strengthened my soul. My enemies say that I have no Savior, but I know that I have one in you. How many times can you think of when you thought, things of the same, in the same manner, in the same way. At what point have you come to the realization that defeat is imminent unless you turn to God? On, on Wednesday night we were talking about when people hit rock bottom, but knowing we know as Christians that God is the rock. So when people are hitting rock bottom, they're hitting, getting to God, and He can save. That is where David went. He went to God. And by the end of the prayer, David had gone from depression to hope. Prayer allows us to express those real and raw emotions to God as we talk it out. God will get us to see from the correct perspective. And we will know his peace. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 19 has Habakkuk praying and it is at the end of his prayer that we can see an example of that. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though 
the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren. Even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Yet there's still that burning question. How long, Lord? I've heard so many stories of people who were up to their eyeballs in their sin. Addicted to drugs or alcohol, pornography, anger issues, whatever that sin was. Yet the minute they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, God takes away their sin 100% gone. It's like a 180 degree turn and they are a completely different person. Sometimes God does do miraculous works in people's lives with seemingly no effort. So the question then becomes, why not me, Lord? How long for me, Lord? Why can't I be changed instantly? Wednesday night we studied the story of Naaman. And we read through 2 Kings 5, 1 through 15. Naaman, he was just an ordinary guy, just like the, you know, an ordinary person, just like all of us. He had a lot going for him. He had a few things going against him. That's just, I'm just, I was going to just summarize this, and as I was summarizing, it was like, yeah, I might as well just read the passage because it'll do a better job. So the king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him, the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying his gift 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and tents, 10 sets of clothing. Now I want to pause here understand that silver was much more valuable in that time than gold. Now the letter to the king of Israel simply said this, with this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. It always makes me giggle inside a little bit when I think of how this was sent to the king and his response. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, am I God? that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me. And he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went to, with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farbar better than any of these rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, would you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, Go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan and dipped himself seven times. 
as the man of God had instructed him. And as his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child, and he was healed. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him, and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. Now, the seriousness or the length of his illness, we do not know. But it was through a series of events that God would lead a young Israelite girl to his home. And God spoke through her, and that led him to Israel, and that led him then to Elisha's door. This was all so that Naaman might trust God for the healing that he would get. What do you have to do? Go down and dip himself seven times in the Jordan. I often wonder, wondered when I first read this in sense, how would I have reacted? How would you react? How many of us cry out to God for help, telling him how much we need him? But yet, then there it is. The but. But we don't want to let go. We don't want to let God help because we can do it ourselves. Kind of like that little picture I had last week. I can do it like that. Little kids in there. I can do it like that. We can't do it in our own strength. We have to let go. We have to completely surrender. And we have to let God. Now, what if Naaman had refused? What if he had only gone part way with? the task that he had been given. It was a resounding, he wouldn't have gotten healed on Wednesday night. And that's the truth. And many of you have heard of someone, or even know, may know someone that has reacted to God's gift of mercy, grace, and forgiveness by going into a rage. Think about how people take this message. God was involving Naaman in his own healing for his own good. Because Naaman needed to learn a lesson for it to mean something. From a trip to an Israelite king, to Elisha, and finally to the Jordan River. As I thought about it this week, I realized that while Naaman was instantly healed, so this is that you know, we talk about that instant healing. So what if someone just saw the instant healing but didn't know the backstory? They think that it was an instant healing. But God had been working for a long time to get him to that point. We see that a lot. We make snap judgments about a lot of things. Recently, Mark and I were talking about a, uh, a news article. He had seen it on one station here in town, and I had seen it on the other. And so we had both seen different people that we knew in that story. But it was a story about the overflow shelter and how there is a lack of resources for the homeless. And really, a, a people just brushing them off, saying they don't want help. But as someone and I were talking last week before service, we don't know what they were going through prior to that. What are they dealing with that is getting in the way and keeping them in that place? Is there a mental illness? Is there something in their record that prevents them from getting a job? Is there a physical illness that is preventing them from getting a job? Is it just a perception of the life that they currently are in? All the time I see things on uh, social media and online of people coming to Christ and their life changes. Here a while back we talked about uh, Kat Van D, the tattoo artist. People are coming at her saying, how could you have lived that life and now be a Christian? You can't be a Christian. You're not 
you the life you lived before. Wait, what? Moses was a murderer. Noah was a drunk. Rahab was a prostitute. Peter had anger issues. We all have issues. <coughs> but part of that, it can be where we're going through a desert time. We're going through something in our life that God is allowing us to go through to build us, to build our character, to build our faith, to build our trust. So what came out of the waiting? Other than being healed of the leprosy. Well, Naaman learned some things. He learned that there is only one true God. He learned to trust and be obedient to God. He learned that God's ways are best. He learned that God can use anything and anyone to accomplish his purposes. Let's face it. Jordan is not the cleanest river. If you've seen it, it, it really reminds me of the cedar. It's dirty. But if someone, t if I was told to go and dip in the cedar rather than dip in a nice clean pool, what are you going to do? I've been in the cedar. I taught rowing and canoeing and motorboating at Boy Scout camp on the cedar. I would go dip myself in the cedar. I go to don't forget, this is the same river that Jesus was baptized in. How bad could that river be? There's something pretty special about that little river. Now, what can we do during our difficult times while we wait? So I'm going to give you some things that you can do while you wait. And John Waller's song keeps popping in my head. We'll sing that here a little bit. But the first one is keep praying. That's what is what David did. Start and end your day in prayer. Whether it is as simple as help or thank you or a much longer prayer, keep praying all day long. Remember, it's okay to be real. It's okay to be raw. Be bold. Be specific. Be persistent. As soon as I got to that point, my mind instantly went to Matthew. Let's look at Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshipped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Jesus responded, it is it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. She replied, That's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall beneath their master's table. <clears throat> Dear woman, Jesus said to her, Your faith is great, your request is granted, and your daughter was her daughter was instantly healed. She was persistent. We also, you know, we can go to the scriptures and the persistent widow being persistent. Like so many others, she prayed, she had faith, and she trusted that Jesus would heal her daughter. So keep praying. But again, we talked about it, we have to talk too, but we also have to listen, so keep listening. We don't go to the doctor, list off all these problems that we have, look at the clock, and go, oh, golly, Wouldn't you want to hear what the doctor had to say? If all we ever do is, is speak and never give God the time, and we never listen to what he has to say, we are making the biggest mistake of our entire lives. It's not a one-way street. 
A relationship with God is a two-way conversation, just like it's a relationship between a husband and a wife, between two friends. It's a two-way conversation, one-way conversations, one-way relationships don't last. And now, having a relationship with God, listening to God, can be pretty difficult in this world where we have so many voices filling our heads. Turn on the radio. Turn on the TV. Pick up your phone and go online. All these voices are hitting us. We have to find a way to tune all that out. Turn out, tune out all of the noise and all the distractions of life so that we can hear God's voice. Our next point is we have to keep trusting. Midway through his prayer, we hear David say, but I trust in your unfailing love. After he was healed, we read that Naaman keeps trusting in God. So much so that he loads two mules, or two loads of soil onto two mules to take that soil from Israel back home. Now, to us, that sounds really weird. But in that day, people associated the physical country or the physical nation and the God they worship as one. So by taking that soil home, he was taking God with him. Back to a place that didn't know God. So he was taking him with him, and by doing that, we get to our next point, which is keep rejoicing. David rejoiced because God had rescued him. Naaman rejoiced because God had healed him. Their rejoicing was not in the trials they had gone through, but in the one whose salvation rescued and healed them. Keeping that rejoicing going, though, when you're in the midst of it, that can be the hard part. That's why you will always hear Mark and I say, come, be together with us in the group. If you have the way to get here, get here because there is power in being together as one. And that way, we can keep worshiping. That's our next point, our final point. David said, I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. And Naaman said, I will never again offer burnt offerings or sacrifices to any other God except the Lord. Worshiping the one true God became that important to me that he took two loads of dirt back with him. And then he says this in uh, verses 18 and 19 as he's talking to Elisha. He says, however, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing. When my master, the king, goes into the temple of the god Rimen to worship there and leans on my arm, and may the Lord pardon me when I bow to Go in peace, Elisha said. So Naaman started home. Now, it's important to know that Naaman wasn't going to be bowing to this other God. He was just simply helping his master, the king. <coughs> As we help people through life, we allow people to seek God through us. So I have to imagine maybe that it was Naaman's goal that by helping his master, the king, that he would see God through him and also turn to praise and worship God. When we praise and worship God, it will change how we view our problems. I've gotten to the point these days that when I think of my problems, minor inconvenience, Take the time to look back on your life. All the situations you've been in. And thank God. Thank Him. And give Him all the praise, glory, and honor for bringing you through them. When you think about those times, what felt like forever at the time now feels like a very 
small piece of time. It may even have disappeared into your memory that you don't even remember it anymore. I remember Amanda was eight and her mom moved her to Indiana and I had no idea where they went. They were gone for four years. I had no idea where she was. I still have that plastic red frame with her picture in it that I had sitting on my desk. I took it to work with me and had it at work and then take it home. That way I was, in a way, was always with her, but it always reminded me to lean on God. And even though I was in a desert time, I was leaning on God. And what what's happened? Because I leaned on God and yesterday we got together as a family. All three girls, the grandkids. I sat and watched while they made jewelry. <laughs> it was nothing, but I was happy to be there and spend time with them and to see them. To see the beautiful creations that they that they made. And then to have the comment, Graham posted up some pictures of it and how much we enjoyed the time. And um, Amanda posted, we need to do more things as a family. I no longer have to ask how long or for that. There's other things that I can ask for. How long, I, how long is this pain going to last? How long am I going to feel like they're irrelevant? I mentioned on Wednesday night that you know I've been applying for this one specific type of job at work for now for, well, the first time is 2014, <laughs> but most recently in the last couple of years, and I still haven't gotten it. I almost get there, but I don't quite. But when I look back at it, and look what's happened since that first, not the first time way back, but the first time a couple years ago, the things that have changed for me at work, the things that I now do, how I'm used in different ways than just being on the phones with customers. And I'm not asking God how long anymore. I can just say, what, in, in your time, I'm happy with that. A.W. Tozer said this, when I understand that everything happening to me is to make me more Christ-like, it resolves a great deal of anxiety. It's all about perspective. I'm going to leave you with this story that I came across this week during my devotional time with God. and It's just a wonderful story about perspective with a great answer to how long, Lord. A one-year-old boy shattered his back, falling down a flight of stairs. He spent his entire childhood and youth in and out of hospital. Gavin Reed, the former bishop of Maidstone, interviewed him in church. The boy remarked, God is fair. Gavin asked, how old are you? 17, the boy replied. How many years have you spent in hospital? The boy answered, 13 years. Gavin asked, do you think that is fair? He replied, God has got all of eternity to make it up to me. There's some perspective for you. And even if you're sitting on the ground, like this young lady here is in this picture, God's got you. You may not realize it. You may not feel it. You may not see it. But just like in this depiction here, he is right there. Lord, we worship you today and every day. Thank you for your goodness to us. I know that we have many more battles ahead. But I trust in your unfailing love. I pray that we would all have that same trust in your unfailing love, Father. Help us to hear you above all the noise and the distractions in our lives. Thank you that you promised to lead us and speak to us. Lord, help us to have compassion for those who are still waiting, still wondering how long. Holy Spirit, help us to come alongside them, to listen, to comfort, and to help as you direct us. 
We know that sin and suffering were not part of the original plan. We also know that you have a reason for everything and that it is well above our understanding. Thank you so much for sending us your son. Thank you that no matter what it is that we have or will go through, that you will use it to help us to be more Christ-like. Help us to remember to bring it to you and to listen to what you have to say. Father, we give all the praise, honor, and glory to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Jesus stood in the garden praying to God. Was he asking how long? He said, your will, not mine. Jesus understood. And if we listen to the things that he taught us, we will understand too. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. saying, this is my body broke for you. Take and eat. Towards the end of the meal, he filled the cup again. Saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. Scripture reminds us that as often as we do this, we are to do so until Christ's return. Even now, we are asking, how long, Lord? How long? Until the last person accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's how long. The body of Christ broken for you. Take me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take me. Father, we thank you that through this meal symbolizes how we become one with you. We just thank you, Father. In your son's precious name. on the list this morning because I'm having another surgery. I'm having, I have a herniated disc in my neck and it's locked up my right arm again with severe pain. So it's just, you know, I appreciate your sermon this morning of how long because it's been going on since May of last year and I had a shoulder surgery and all that. So, you know, God is good though, you know, and like Terry said, we don't know how long, but it leads us into other things and for God's glory. Let it be so. Oh, and holy, holy God, just um, bring the Holy Spirit in to rest upon this prayer this morning. So Psalm 68, 4 and 5. Sing to God. Sing praise to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord, and rejoice before him. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. So let's give him praise, honor, and glory this morning, for he is worthy of all our praise. There are times in this life we will be in need, want, pain, or sorrow, but we have a God in heaven to lean on for anything that comes our way. He is our refuge, our strong tower, our comforter. He is the rebuilder of relationships. He can do anything if we call on his mighty name, Jesus in prayer and petition. 
He will answer all who trust and believe in him. So, Father God, help us to do this daily. Father God, we lift up Ellen this morning, who had surgery this morning. Please be with her and comfort her. We lift up Mark. We're thankful that he's here, and we just pray for healing. We lift up Bill and Lori's co-worker Dave and myself this morning. Please cover us with the blood of Jesus. Erase our pain. Heal our bodies. May your mercies come quickly to meet us. Father, we ask for mercy and healing over Lucas for his full recovery. Comfort his family as only you can. Father, when we walk through the valley of the shadow, hold on to us. Let us not fear, for you are always with us. You will never leave us or forsake us. Our cup overflows with blessings abundant. You are a great God. We thank you, Jesus, for the seasons of change you have provided on this earth for us to enjoy. We praise you for the warmer temperatures. We praise you that the shelters are all open for the homeless. We thank you that you always provide the needs of your people. You are an awesome God and so worthy to be praised. We pray for our children and grandchildren to meet their needs right where they are. Guide them always on the path to righteousness for your name's sake. In Colossians 3, 12 through 14, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We praise and honor you today, Father God, for life and breath and all things. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Well, thinking I was being smart and going to avert the same problem we had last week, used a different phone and everything for the recording this morning and the live feed dropped out within the first few minutes. Oh my gosh. So, we'll get it up there, but <laughs> hey, it's a minor inconvenience. That's right. So, as we close this portion, and before we go to the music, this is, some people say they have a light verse, some say they have a guiding verse. This is just a verse that I absolutely love. It speaks to me in multiple different ways. I think I was first drawn to it because it talks about eagles, and I'm an Eagle Scout, so it was just one of those things. But the more I read it, the more I study it, the more it means to me. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise of this verse. Help us, Lord, that in the waiting that we would trust in your unfailing word and in your unfailing love. God, instead of quitting, give us the strength to continue doing your will. We continue to pray for the strength and endurance that we need each and every day. Remind us that we cannot do it on, in our own strength and under, in it, or in our own understanding, but only because you sustain us. Renew us each day, Lord. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.